the water crisis in poor countries is a crisis that costs lives, it deprives people of their dignity, it forces women into arduous labour, it keeps children out of school. And that's why we're arguing in the report that if the world is serious about the Millennium Development Goals, they've got to get the story right on water. The title of the report is Beyond Scarcity. So the crisis that we're talking about is not ultimately about scarcity, it's about the management and the governance of water. What we're trying to do in the report is to draw attention to the way that water is priced, the way that it's allocated to different groups in society. Not having water means that women are walking three or four hours a day to carry 20 kilo cans of water back to their homes. Not having enough water means that you have insufficient water to maintain the most basic functions of life, to keep your children healthy, to quench your thirst, to wash yourself in, to maintain your dignity. There are over two billion people in the world who don't have access to sanitation. But actually, it wasn't really till I stood here that I understood what, what that means. What we've got here is a toilet for 71,000 people. These are plastic bags that are full of human excrement. People just dump them here because they have no alternative. When it rains, this whole hillside of human excrement and plastic bags floods, come straight down this hill into this residential area down here. And even worse than that, what you've got here is the main water pipe, which is serving the whole slum. This water pipe is completely covered with human excrement. In some places it's leaking, so you've got excrement actually leaching into the water supply. You see an example of this problem right, right here. This is a feeder pipe. This water is full of human excrement and it's being sucked into this pipe right here where you can see it leaking. Now th this is basically going to carry human excrement right into the water that somebody drinks down, down, this, uh, down this lane here. And that really helps to explain why you know, you've got such high death rates in this slum. We were just told by one of the teachers that it's not un unusual for ten, in a, in a class of 26 children, it's not unusual for 10 of them to be absent because of problems with diarrhea. I think this demonstrates as powerfully as anything you can think of the links between what happens in water and sanitation and what happens in education. What sort of opportunities in life do these kids have? And it's an example of how unless you can get this right, you're not going to get what happens in the school right. The answers to the problem vary from country to country. We argue that really there's a three-step approach. First, the governments need to institute water as a basic human right and they need to mean it. That means you don't just put it in the constitution, everybody should have an entitlement to at least 20 litres of water a day. In the case of poor people who can't afford to pay, that water should be free. Secondly, the international donor community needs to do much more. And thirdly, we argue that we need a global action plan for water. Water is not on the G8 agenda in a credible and serious way. If the world is serious about tackling the water crisis, we need international partnerships to come up with the solutions. 200 years ago, you had child death rates in cities like New York and Chicago and Paris and London and Manchester that were just as bad as you got in Kibera today. Now, what, what changed the story in those cities was that governments decided that that was enough. They, they saw the huge human cost associated with the deficit in water and sanitation. They saw the damage that it was doing for economic growth, for productivity, and they did something about it. And what we need to see is governments in Africa, in the developing world, and in rich countries doing something about this now. This really has to end tomorrow.
Nanagi, go, go, 